Good morning. So hi, my name is Dustin Humphreys. Uh, today I'm uh, the Senior Vice President of Digital uh, Innovation and E-Commerce at Rite Aid. Um, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to, we're going to talk about experimentation. It's something I'm super passionate about. Um, I would say probably, probably eight to ten years ago, I really started getting into how, how organizations could innovate and find tremendous value uh, through experimentation uh, and trying to do that rapidly. I would say it's been a journey for me and uh, my organizations that I've worked with. And we're going to talk to these two gentlemen who have a lot of experience here and, and a lot of expertise. <clears throat> it's been great talking with you guys. Can you guys introduce yourselves? who you work for, a little bit about your journey, and maybe how your job today relates to experimentation in your organization. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Rubini. I'm a senior manager of online product management at the Home Depot. I'm basically the orange version of Mary Beth's organization <laughs> in many ways. Uh, I also focus on uh, top of funnel, uh, high consideration, high complexity browse journeys is, is the community I lead. Uh, and I'm part of a larger organization called Interconnected Experience, which is, it's the online team, but we're very much uh, interested and care about driving traffic uh, to our stores. Uh, it's a big differentiator for us. Been with Home Depot about eight years. I've worked a lot of places, done a lot of things. I was at Intuit uh, in financial services for a while. I've worked in retail point of sale for NCR. A couple of weird startups along the way that I don't We'll have to talk about it the next uh, next event. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here. Nice to meet a lot of you over the last couple of days. Hey everybody, my name's uh, <coughs> oh man, haven't talked this morning. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name's Kevin Washington. I am the director of product management at uh, Best Buy. I currently am over experimentation, customer experience, feedback measurement. So please take your surveys when you get them in the uh, mail and text and all that and uh, also some predictive analytics that goes into a lot of that. So I spent a lot of time looking across our end-to-end -end horizontal journeys and saying, what are we testing? Why are we testing it? Maybe we shouldn't be testing that or let's do a different type of experiment. Um, so it's been a lot of time there. And uh, before that, I was at Nordstrom, where I own the Nordy Club, and then I was actually at Home Depot uh, before that. And we know a lot of the same people because when we connected on LinkedIn, I think we had 120 uh, <laughs> share, shared contacts. So I actually know some of them. Yeah, same. It's a small world in digital. So um, <clears throat> when you started uh, talking about this, Kevin, I think it's a good topic. How do you determine what you should test and when? I think that would be a good topic to, to kick us off. For sure. Um, it's, a, it's a big question. And it's one that I don't think a lot of teams do a great job of answering, um, especially when you're talking about these large enterprises. Test everything was something that was said in the Bay Area for years, fail quickly, try to iterate, all that stuff. Um, the big question that people need to ask though is why are we testing this, right? We need to understand what are the assumptions that you're trying to validate when you're going to run a test and if you're really doing nothing more than saying, ah, well, I don't know if it's gonna work, so I'm just gonna throw it out there and see what happens, that's cool at a startup, but if you're talking about I'm gonna go spend, let's call it eight weeks of dev time, these teams are around $2 million these days for a full stack team, uh, that's a lot of money to go and just throw something out and see what happens. So how can we de-risk some of the things that we're doing up front before we run an A-B test, before we go and throw something in market. Um, so that's a lot of the questions that I asked today. It's what are we trying to test? What's the hypothesis? We believe by doing X we will achieve Y per Z audience. And then what are the assumptions that must be true? That, that we always talk about leap of faith assumptions in product management. What's that biggest thing that you need to learn? And if this thing is wrong, this thing fails, and probably anything else that we want to do within this uh, approach might also fail. But if it wins, now we have an idea of how we're going to iterate into this, and take those learnings and push them forward. How can you learn the most by spending the least amount of time and money? I love that. Dave, you got anything to add on that? I think uh, the key word that stood out to me was hypothesis-driven. Um, testing is a kind of a great equalizer when used in the right way. Uh, when you have uh, stakeholders like just go build this thing, you you can you can sort of um, 
put it in the right perspective by, well, like, that's an interesting idea. You're saying that if we do X, Y will happen. Let's, let's try something um, lightweight and learn. And, and nine times out of 10, you, it's not what you expected. It could be better. It's often very different than what you expected. And so I think um, trying to work with your stakeholders to use testing not to prove anything, but truly to learn and, and better understand the problem you're solving so that then you can move fast or aggressively in one, you know, based on what the feedback is. So we've sort of talked about what to test, when, and kind of what you're looking for. There's been a lot of advancement in methods of testing in the last couple of years, uh, or I'd say last 10 years. Do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the different options that are out there and when leveraging those different options might be more appropriate? I love the framework you started to share, but I know we don't have visuals here. So yeah. just like, like maybe just touch on a few of the different types and when those types are, are good to deploy. Yeah, I think um, I, I have, I, have I spend way too much time thinking about this. Most normal product people, I think, are not as deep as I tend to go, so I'm going to keep this a little bit higher level. But if you're trying to think about why are we testing, we're testing so that we can gain more confidence in the thing that we're trying to achieve before we put it all the way out in market because we don't want to hurt anything, and we also want to make sure that the goodness that we think is going to happen does. We want to see how the market's going to react sometimes, too more exploratory. But the way that I like to think about it, if you have a two by two, because product people love two by twos, I'm sure anybody that's worked with them has, has seen the sticky notes on the board. Um, one axis is known versus unknown, and the other axis is low risk and high risk. And within that framework, you can start to plot, okay, well, if this is a low risk and high known thing, why are we testing it? Why are we going to spend two to three weeks A-B testing this in market and doing all of this instrumentation if we know that it's going to work most likely? We just want to make sure we didn't break anything. That's a good example of, hey, let's go do a do no harm test where instead of starting at kind of this middle ground where you need to reach a detectable effect up or down to say this thing was a win or this thing was a loss, you just say, okay, as long as it doesn't do worse than this, we're going to keep rolling it because we know this is the right thing to do and it's where we want to move. Um, and that's where pre-post analyses come in too if you're really looking for incrementality but you want to just keep rolling. Doing a difference in difference analysis is great for that. If you're a little bit more complex, you can think about a regression analysis. And then on the opposite side of that, how do you test things that we really don't know what is going to happen? And I have a few different ideas and I kind of want to test all of them but I don't want to take two or three months to test a bunch of stuff sequentially. Multivariate is great for that. You have your A, B, and C thing that you want to change, and then you just kind of shuffle them around with each other and then test all of it at the same time. You need a lot more traffic for that, but most likely you're going to have a higher statistical power, which I, I shouldn't use that word. You're going to have a higher impact on the metric that you're trying to move, which you need less traffic at that point. So it's all kind of a balancing game, but um, that's, a, that's a high level of it. Anything you want to add? Yeah, so <clears throat> Kevin, your focus is on measurement and testing, and, and I use, or our, our teams use experimentation and testing as one of the levers we use to just get our job done. Um, we do work with, like, your counterpart, um, and I would say uh, we, we love statistical significance. We can't always afford to wait for it, so we use a lot of different methods. Um, we partner a lot with our UX research teams for qualitative analysis, the power of just showing someone who's not you something we're thinking about doing and just getting, you know, five people, six people to just tell you it sucks is very powerful. <laughs> and um, usually if- statistically if, significant? Yeah, I was gonna say, if five people tell you something's great or conversely, you should listen to them. It doesn't mean you throw it out, but you it, it causes you to do something different and it's pretty lightweight. At the other end of the spectrum, in addition to working, um, we use like Adobe Test and Target, which is sort of a framework that lets you, you know, set up experiments and collect good data on it. We love that, but we have limited, uh, we have, there are limitations to how much you can do there and there's some overhead. Uh, but we have other tools like um, Quantum Metric, which gives us 
access to individual session playback. Also, a lot of we do a lot with heat maps. You know, think of a weather map of the page you're looking at, and whether you like it or not, people click on things that aren't clickable, and it's good to know that wow, most people are clicking on these images. Maybe we should make them go somewhere. Um, again, not always relying on statistics uh, as the only uh, indicator. And then in between um, is, again, showing things to people and letting them interact with them that don't work for your company. <laughs> you know, uh, that is definitely very guerrilla tactics, but we all do this, like you show your friend, like, hey, you know, talk about an idea and you get feedback. I don't think we make huge business decisions, but don't underestimate the power of an innocent bystander reacting to an idea and, and looking for themes there. Great. Um, so it sounds like you guys might be organized a little differently uh, in your two organizations. Can you talk about the different approaches to how an organization, you know, executes on um, on experimentation. Like I've worked in organizations where we sort of had to centralize that function mm -hmm. because it does require an element of expertise to, to get it right. So yeah, central versus decentralized. How is your organization organized and, and can you talk about that? Sure, I'll start this one. So both of us work for pretty large organizations and um, and even within Home Depot, there are variations. Um, we have a centralized experimentation team, but we are not forced. Uh, we use them when we want to do, you know, e true experiments with statistical significance. Um, so we we definitely leverage those. The product manager or the product management function also has a responsibility for working with our analytics partners. A lot of uh, our thought process is, is looking at what's happened in the past, looking uh, for how an existing feature is performing. So um, bringing data to the table that already is there to help form the hypothesis is a very important part. Uh, if it's something brand new though, you don't have that benefit other than to prove that there really is a problem here. For some reason, no one's converting on this page or feature or something like that. Um, and then I think I mentioned our UX partners for more qualitative um, information. And that's, that's usually very early in a project uh, when you're trying to come up with a completely new way of doing something. And I'd say, again, it, experimentation is a tool in my toolbox. I would go to, let's say, your organization equivalent when I'm ready to really get the hard data. and the. The more impactful the impact, the decision you're making, I think the more important and and credible credibility you need to to uh, to have because you don't want to do harm. You may be making a decision about you know something that could cost the organization a lot of either misrevenue or just expense. So, Kevin, that, I think that's great. Um, at Best Buy, when I first got here, um, it was incredibly centralized. Uh, a little bit of centralization, I think, is good within uh, experimentation, especially if you're in a more early stage of, let's call it data acumen and experiment or agile acumen organization, uh, which a lot of these larger organizations are. Um, but it was extremely centralized to the point that when a team would come to us and say, hey, we want to run a test, there was a team that actually built the experiment on within. We had a dev team that would go and like, okay, cool, we'll go build it for you which was crazy to me because of how many different tech stacks we had within the organization and, and that wasn't working. So we pulled back to um, a hybrid model is what we would call it. Um, so it's still centralized from a consulting, from an analytics, uh, from an operations perspective, but we've pushed the planning and the dev side back to the product teams. So we actually built out an experiment plan template that we are now using and having the organization say, when you're planning your feature, think about this experiment and say and answer these questions so that by the time you get to us and you need a consultation, we're all on the same page. That's cool. I think that both of you sound like you're kind of in a hybrid sort of organization yeah. now. So, um, you know, I didn't plan for this question, but it just occurred to me, like, when, when a test is executed um, and a centralized team is involved, how is that information memorialized and you know, Kevin, I think you mentioned this in the past, where, you know, 
a new product manager wants to come and test something, and you're like, oh yeah, we ran a test like that six months ago or, or, or two years ago, and here's what we learned, and maybe you could avoid running that test altogether, but can you talk about how that's memorialized and, and, and shared, democratized in your organization? Yeah, for us, um, our centralized tests always result in kind of a readout, and those readouts are archived, and it's definitely worth going back, because chances are, in a big organization, someone's thought about some aspect of the problem. You know, uh, things change over time, websites and architectures change, but you can learn a lot, um, and that team does a good job. They have like a weekly, maybe monthly newsletter that kind of highlights a recent test and learnings and always generates a lot of, um, I, I really look forward to those. Um, but there is definitely still a lot of tribal knowledge, if for lack of a better term, where you, oh, you should talk to Joe because Joe worked on that five years ago and it was a disaster or, or that turned into this other thing. And so there is a, there is just a whole, you know, internal network that you find people that have thought about that, and, and that's a huge source of, of value. And yeah, at, at Best Buy, I think when I first got, so I've only been there for 10 months, so like, that's why I keep saying when I first got there. When I first got there, everything was slides, and those slides were kind of sort of in the same SharePoint sometimes, but then also in Confluence sometimes, and then if you wanted to go and just find a test that had happened a couple of years ago, uh, hope there was a really good documentation person on that team at the time. So where we are now, one of the nice things with that, back to that experiment plan template that I'm very proud of, um, at the bottom of it, there's a section for the results where it says, what was your communication plan and who was this communicated to? What was the result of the experiment? What was the decision that was made and what was the reasoning for that decision? So at the very least, you can do a keyword search in Confluence at any point in time for this document and you can not only see, oh, this was the result, but you can scroll up and look at everything that went into the experiment how they tested it, why they tested it, what the hypothesis was, what the assumptions were, but they were trying to learn what they actually learned. And so it keeps it all in one nice centralized location, and then you can click back in even into the JIRA and then see all of the work that went into that. So it starts to kind of daisy chain itself together. So that's something that's worked for us. I really want to get to the point that we're doing a newsletter. Um, we need some more resources, but, but that newsletter sounds phenomenal. Do either of you have like a memorable experimentation or experiment that was either a big success or a big failure or just something really unexpected that came of it that you want to share with your? I have one that's uh, kind of still in process. Uh, so this, we do a lot of pilots, which is not necessarily the same as an experiment in the sense that it's just limited to a certain number of SKUs. And um, one of my teams is focused on the role of uh, visualization in high consideration products. So I'm, you know, everything from AR, VR to just, um, of course, generative AI is coming into play. We work, uh, can't give all the details, but we're working with a, a third party vendor that had a particular offer in the 3D space. And we launched a pilot with like 100 major appliance SKUs and 100 decor SKUs. So like sofas, dressers, things like that. And we ran, we ran the feature, or excuse me, we launched it into production, so there was nothing like it before, so it was not an A-B test, and we've just watched it over several months, and uh, it's been fascinating, same feature functionality, but we found people behave differently when it's a decor product than when it's a, a major appliance. Uh, and this is a super high level, it's a, you know, a 3D model of, let's say, a washer, and you can spin it around and see the dimensions and it actually you know, can open and close the doors. If it's a fridge, you know how fridges have a million doors, you wanna know does it open up, down, sideways. <laughs> On the decor side, it was mostly just uh, seeing, you know, seeing the couch in, in a realistic view, being able to see the back of it, et cetera. And it, I would say we are getting success, but people behave very differently when they're buying a, a major appliance and we, we were able to dig into it and really zero in on uh, and really start thinking like, why are we seeing such different results? Uh, when you're buying a couch, there are many other factors other than functionality. It's, you know, will it go in my space? Will it, uh, you know, will it fit in the style I have? And those are very hard things to measure. And in appliances, like, oh, this, I don't like this fridge because the door opens up and I want one that open or whatever out versus left or right. So we were able to uh, 
hypothesize that where functionality is involved, the role of animation or the role of dimensions is in certain categories is different. So we're learning a lot there. Uh, we're still in pilot. We're still, there's some things that are not working. Um, and then the big question we have is like, how can we do this at scale? Is it worth it? It's not free to work with a third party. And so a lot of our decisions are, are okay, that worked, now what? Or is it even possible to scale it to the size of a catalog like Home Depot? Not every product needs, let's say, a 3D model, but there's certain ones where it's expected and some, you know, do I need a 3D model of a hammer, for example? I, <laughs> I would say no. But. Maybe, probably not. All right, uh, last question, and then we'll get to, to the audience questions. Um, kind of what's next for experimentation in your organization and where is it going? Like where does experimentation go from here? So this is a fun one. Um, I get to I get the distinct pleasure of thinking about the five year where we want to be as Best Buy when it comes to experimentation. And um, for me it's omnichannel, right? I want to understand if a customer walks into a store, I should be able to at that moment say, okay, that customer is now in split A and they're going to get this series of treatments, not just within the mobile app as they're in the store doing wayfinding, but also as for their uh, marketing and any kind of emails that we're looking at. And also when they go into their app and their home and they're shopping, maybe they get a different homepage experience. And I wanna be able to test things that span a much larger gambit than we can today. Um, but even just pulling in more of that store data to say, hey, did we drive trips to the store? And then what did that look like as part of, was this test successful? And as we're doing these deep dive analyses, it starts to get a little bit more into the, how data is actually flowing um, within the company piece, but I'm, I'm trying to help with some of that. Um, but then I also, I think, I don't wanna say AI, but there are some AI use cases around, um, particularly on the qualitative side of feedback and taking that in and getting to propensity scoring and some other stuff off of the natural language processing that you can do with what customers are saying, not just in reviews, but also in surveys, and also in surveys by page, and then also surveys by store, and pulling all of that in and then adding that to, hey, did we change anything with the experience when it came to the experiments that we were running and did we see any change in NPS five star start to extrapolate into LTV based on these larger signals. There's a lot of super interesting stuff that you can start to get into. It's just really complex and it doesn't 100% exist yeah, anywhere. That, it's kind of mind blowing thinking about like every single customer journey and how, how across the omni-channel and across emails and all that, how all that can be kind of an, an experimentation landscape. It's pretty cool. What about you, Dave? Yeah, I would, I would, uh, Echo, I think the ability to measure uh, customer behavior across channels, digital, physical, and then experiment based on that is really hard. <laughs> and I think it's gonna take five years to, to get it where, where we're confident in it. Um, uh, and I also believe, uh, I, I do think over-personalization is bad, but the ability to, to be able to measure that and then cater an experience to a segment or an individual at some point <coughs> Um, and vary that, vary that in a way that you can learn what works for that. I think it's, I really think the future is gonna be about continuous, uh, it, it won't be an experiment, the, the interface is gonna morph to, based on your behavior and it'll always be running an experiment and based on how you behave, I mean it's happening now, you'll start to get, very, you don't have to be careful about it, but it, you'll start to get experiences that if you're a DIYer, we shouldn't be showing you services messaging, or, or conversely, if we notice, you know, you, you had carpet installed, that's a signal that you're open to, you know, having someone come to your house and do that for you. And I, I would like to see experimentation just built in to the experience. I do think it's incredibly complex and we're, we're not gonna get there quickly though. I, well, that, oh, go ahead. I, I do just wanna say one, what you said right there, I'm, actually really excited about some of the possibilities when it comes to personalization. If you have that personalization engine, being able to experiment on different aspects of segments, markets, whatever it may be, and then feed that back into, it's almost halfway between rules and just letting the model do what it does. I've been playing with some of that lately and it's been a lot of fun. I thought it was really interesting when our, we talked earlier 
you said a big part of what you do with respect to AI and stuff is testing different AI models against one yeah. another. Like, the, you know, the experiment is testing these different AI models. Really, really, really fascinating. So thank you guys for your time, and uh, let's take a few questions. Hi. Natalie Olson from Neiman Marcus Group. I have a question for Kevin. Um, so you were talking a lot about like the structure that you've built around your testing processes and being more intentional about what we're testing, why are we testing it. My perception of all that is it's slowing down the amount of testing that you're doing. So I'm curious to hear a bit more about tempo and how you kind of strike that right balance of being more intentional, intentional more thoughtful but also how do we realize impact sooner? We gotta get things moving and keep the tempo up. How do you find that right balance? It's actually funny that you say that. Um, I won't say that, I, can't, I guess I can't say the number of tests that we're running right now, but we're running a lot. Even if we cut that number in half, we're still running quite a few. And what I've found as we're sl having teams slow down to think about what they're doing, we're actually reducing the number of tests, yes, but only about 20% reduction. And what I'm seeing is that there are more meaningful tests that are happening. And actually the combining of some tests as we're giving more visibility to folks so that they understand, oh wait, you're doing that? Oh wait, we're testing the same. Oh, well, we should just do a multivariate and put, put it together. So that's been great. Um, and m my key metric that I'm pushing for is speed to market and speed to learning for meaningful tests. And so I'm trying to get things out the door more quickly, which today it takes a long time. And I'm trying to make sure that we have those insights somewhere so that we're helping folks. So um, the little bit on both sides, reduction in tests lets us spend more time on the meaningful ones and be faster about getting those results back to teams. Is there, is there anything that we should just go do or should we really test everything, like everything? No, I, I think running when I think about test everything, testing things for 48 hours to make sure you didn't break anything in production, 100%, you should always do that. <laughs> Running a two week online controlled experiment, completely unnecessary. In a lot of cases, it's about getting to confidence. You don't need to get to stat sig on every single thing to have enough confidence to roll it out. I would say test one way decisions, don't test two way decisions. Meaning, if there's no turning back, take your time. <laughs> Make sure you're doing the right thing. If if you can turn off a feature switch or back it off or or just say like, nope, then the, the risk is just lower. Uh, even getting bad news about a feature, if, as long as you can do something about it quickly, then your tolerance for risk is better. You know, we're not, I was like to say, we're not designing airplane cockpits where the cost of being wrong is extremely high not to belittle the complexity of our very, very important jobs, but, <laughs> but we are, we're retailers and, and we need to, um, you know, you should be taking some risk, but it doesn't mean you have to validate every single decision. Oh, one more. Oh, no. Oh, you faked me out over here. <laughs> and I will say, if you want to just put things in production, that's cool, because pilots are the way to go for that. Just putting something out for five or 10% of users and seeing how they react to it, that's cool. But you don't need to do, you don't need to all the instrumentation of an A-B test for that. Kevin, Dave, Dustin, thank you guys so much. Thank you guys. Thank y'all so much.